great. So just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm actually a physics teacher uh, in the city. I work at Pace High School. I teach 11th and 12th graders physics. Uh, as of next year, I'll also be teaching them astronomy. Uh, this will be very interesting, especially for the school because they've never had astronomy before. Um, I'm super passionate about physics and astronomy, which is why I became a NASA Solar System Ambassador. So I'm here representing uh, Na the NASA Solar System Ambassador Program and going to you guys to spread science knowledge Knowledge and get you guys excited specifically about the eclipse this summer. Um, yeah, so let's get started a little bit about the sun. So the radius from the center to the edge of the sun, it's about uh, 6.9 followed by seven zeros after the nine uh, meters. A meter is about this big. So just imagine 69 million of them roughly. Like they're, it's a huge sun. Uh, the earth can fit across the entire sun 109 times. So this is about, to put it into perspective, that's us. That little dot right there, yeah, that's, that's us. Very, very tiny. <coughs> um, so you can fit 109 across. That being said, uh, Jupiter, Jupiter is the biggest in our solar system. How many times, if the, sun, if the Earth can fit 109 times across? Take a guess, you guys, how many times can we fit Jupiter across? Across the sun, yeah. 20? 12. 12. Any other guesses? It's going to be about 10, so you were close. You guys were close with 12. That's about as big as Jupiter. So you can actually fit the Earth 10 times across Jupiter, so you can fit Jupiter about 10 times across the sun. Uh, yeah, that's our biggest planet in our solar system. So the sun, massive. It's just so far away, it looks small, uh, but in reality, the sun is huge. Uh, the mass of the sun is the number two followed by 30 zeros. That's a huge number. Like, I can't even fit that if I wrote it all out on the screen. Uh, kilograms. Kilograms, 2.2 2. 2 pounds, to put that into perspective. That's 300,000 Earths. So sun, huge, and it's massive. The luminosity, luminosity is how bright it is. So imagine a 40-watt light bulb. Now put that, um, put 25 zeros at the end of that 40-watt uh, light bulb. That's how bright the sun is. That's why when you're looking at like really bright light and you kind of like look away, you kind of see kind of um, the outline of the light that you were just looking at. That's actually your eyes fixing itself because you're slowly damaging it and if you keep looking at it for too long. The sun is so bright, that's why it doesn't take more than a few seconds to just um, to kill your eyes beyond repair. So that's why they say when you're looking at the sun, be very careful. A lot of astronomers, before they realize how quickly the sun can hurt your eyes, started losing their vision very quickly because they were doing so, ma so many uh, observations with the sun. So that's about it. Uh, this fancy looking thing, does any, has anyone ever seen something like this before? Just out of curiosity, do you know what it is? Yeah. Spectrum? Oh, nice. Cool. We got some professionals in the audience. A lot of people don't know about this. Uh, this is what we call an atomic spectrum uh, or spectra multiple, spectrum singular. Um, this, if you look at different elements and different molecules like air, um, even just hydrogen, anything as simple or as complex, you're going to get this thing. It's called the element's fingerprint, the spectrum. The topmost thing, you guys see how it's just like a rainbow? That's just white light. It's just light coming in with nothing in it. Um, as soon as you start adding like elements into it, it starts getting funky. So like the first one, Na, sodium from chemistry, if you guys remember that. Uh, sodium has specifically two green lines, two yellow lines, two orange lines, one red line, only in that place. So just like every person has their own fingerprint, every element has its own fingerprint called a spectrum. So we actually use spectrums to see what stars are made of, because we can't just get in a rocket ship and fly over. We can't even get in a rocket ship, fly to the moon, because it's so expensive, let alone fly to the sun, also because we're going to burn up if we try to do that. So how do we figure out how these things are made of? We look at the spectrum of the stars and planets and other things that we want to see what they're made of, specifically stars, because we can't physically go there and take samples. Mars is nice. We can land there, take some samples, send it back to the lab, it's nice. Stars, not, not so easy. So we use this to see what it's made of. And notice um, some of them have, for example, 
Uh, looking at uh, all of them have red lines, but notice the red lines vary in numbers, but also the red lines vary in placement. So you can have a red line, a line specifically in red, but it might be a little skewed going to different elements. And that's how you're able to tell the difference. That's why like certain people might have that swirl, but that swirl might not be exactly the same for one fingerprint than another. So this is actually really useful to us. Oh, and the numbers across the top and the bottom, that's the wavelength, the length of the wave. So as you can see, the smaller numbers, shorter wavelengths is purple, violet light, and the longer wavelengths is red light towards the end. So talking, now that you guys, most of you guys who didn't know, now that you do know about spectrum, let's look, about, let's look at this. This fancy looking thing is the spectrum of the sun. So people took the spectrum, they analyzed it, and they were able to tell exactly what the sun is made of. So looking at these, and I'm not going to make you guys analyze it. I wouldn't even want to sit and analyze it myself. It's going to be way too strenuous. A lot of uh, very, very intelligent and uh, particular people have done this for us, and they told us what it's made of. Uh, the sun is mostly made of helium and hydrogen. Um, but also, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but this picture, if you guys ever Google it, uh, the spectrum of the sun, um, it's also made of oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, silicon, magnesium, iron, neon, and sulfur. That's why we're not just getting just lines of hydrogen and helium, we're getting all, a bunch of other lines because it also has traces of other elements. Not as strong, but they're still there. So yeah, very pretty. It, and this is called an absorption spectrum, in case you're interested. What that means is the lines are being absorbed by the element that the sun is made of. That's why we're seeing black lines with a rainbow background. This, if anyone ever took earth science uh, and remembers earth science, uh, this, does anyone know what this is called? Ooh, so this is called the HR diagram, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. What this means is they classify stars based on brightness, the y-axis, and temperature, the x-axis. So if something is super, super hot, it's going to be towards that way. If something is super, super bright, it's going to be towards the up. So notice, the hottest and the brightest stars are what color? Do you guys see that they're blue? which a lot of people is a crazy thought. They're like, blue? Even my mom the other day when I was telling her about it, she's like, I thought blue was cold. A lot of people think blue is cold. But actually, the bluest stars are the hottest stars. And the reddest stars, notice, they're not as bright and they're not as hot. So we have all of these stars towards the bottom. Uh, they're not that hot and they're not, and they're not that bright. So our sun is actually like right in the middle like, it's a yellow star. It's not exactly in the middle. It's a little bit lower. Um, you see that green line pointing to it, and it actually says sun next to it. But it says lifetime 10 to the 10 years. That's about how long our sun is going to live. So not, not so little amount of time, but not as, not as little as towards the top. If you notice, the blue stars only have 10 to the 7 years. So that's a one followed by seven zeros, whereas our sun has 10 zeros preceding it. So we're going we're gonna to have our sun for a lot longer than some of the hotter stars, which is, which is good. A way that like, I actually tell people to remember it, the hotter and brighter you are, the faster you burn out because you're using up all your energy really quickly. That's why the hot, bright stars are the brightest and the hottest, but they live the shortest, whereas the coolest and the dimmest live for eons, so, so many years, very, very long. So our sun falls on the main sequence towards the middle. It is a G star, so the O, B, A, F, G, K, M letters are just types of stars. A way that people remember it is, O, B, a fine girl, kiss me. It's an old saying, but that's how you remember the pattern of it. O, B, A, fine girl, kiss me. So other people have made other mnemonics, but that's like the oldest one, so it kind of like sticks in my mind the easiest. Um, but our star, our sun, is a G star, and our luminosity, how bright it is, we just say that it's one because that's the easiest thing we can look at. So we just say, okay, how bright is this star in comparison to our sun? So we're like, oh, it's two times as bright, so two luminosity, so two solar luminosity. Um, 
And also we do solar radius. So solar radius, how big is the star in comparison to our sun? So we use our sun for basically everything. Um, how big is something, how bright it is, we always compare it to our sun. It's just easier for our calculations because it's the closest one to us. Um, and I always get this question, will the sun die? Yeah, it will, eventually, not anytime soon, but it will. Um, and then the following question is like, what's gonna happen when it dies? Here's what's gonna happen. So you could be two types of stars. You could be an average star, like average small star, um, or a massive star. Our star is an average star, but let's look at massive stars, because massive stars are kind of cool, and then I'll go back and talk about our sun, which is an average star. Massive stars, all stars come from planetary nebulas, like all this gas and dust starts congesting together, you start getting all these stars born, and then if a lot of stuff congests together, you get massive stars, the blue ones, the hot ones, uh, towards the top of the diagram that we were just looking at. Um, eventually, it's gonna reach the end of its life, and st will start reaching the end of its life and become a red supergiant. So it's gonna start swelling up, turning red, and getting huge. So actually, in the Orion Nebula, we have Betelgeuse, which is a star, also a movie, but it's also a star. Um, he, uh, um, that star is a red supergiant, so that's an example of a red supergiant. And if you ever look at the Orion uh, constellation, can't see it now because it's the summer, you can see it more in the winter. It's kind of like those three stars across that everybody usually sees. That's the Orion belt. Uh, towards the shoulder, kind of like his right shoulder, is a red star, and it's so bright that you can actually even see it with your naked eye that it's actually red. That's Betelgeuse right there. So a star like that would eventually collapse in on itself. And why does that happen? It has fusion. Fusion is what makes the sun glow and the stars glow. So it's helium fusing into hi um, hydrogen, fusing into helium and so on. Eventually it's going to run out of energy. Fusion pushes out on the star. Gravity pulls in on the star. So gravity is keeping us on the earth right now. Same thing, on the st uh, same thing with stars. Gravity is pulling in on the outside of the star, but fusion is pushing back on it. And it's like a nice little teeter-totter that's happening. Eventually, the star is going to get too old and too weak, and it's going to run out of energy that eventually it, starts make, it stops making fusion, and the whole thing just collapses in on itself. And the whole thing goes boom in a big supernova explosion, literally. So very bright, very catastrophic. If the star was big enough, it will become a black hole. So it needs to be huge for it to become a black hole. So that's why there's like a limit to how big a star can be before it becomes a black hole. It can be huge, uh, but not be big enough to be a black hole. And when that happens, it becomes a neutron star. And what a neutron star is, well, atoms are made of electrons, neutrons, and protons. It's literally just a bunch of neutrons condensed together. So as closely packed as we can get it, it just came together immediately um, into like this one massive ball. And that and neutron stars are actually about the size of Manhattan. So imagine something so huge, so much bigger than our sun, and now it's the size of Manhattan. So it's so dense that a teaspoon of a neutron star is, is about the same mass as a fully loaded bus. So super dense, super compact together. Our star, our sun, is not a massive star, so it's not going to go supernova, but something else was going to happen, but still pretty cool. It's eventually going to become a red giant. So in about 4 billion years, uh, people are like, oh, in 4 billion years, our sun will explode. Not explode, it's going to swell up and become really, really big and really, really red. It will engulf completely. It's going to be so big. It's going to engulf Mercury. It's going to engulf Venus, and the jury's still out on whether it's going to fully engulf the Earth or whether it's going to stop right before the Earth. But even if it stops right before the Earth, like that sun is going to be so close to us, it's just going to burn off everything on the surface. So we, we have four billion years to get out of here before the sun expands and uh, completely wipes us out. <laughs> Eventually, um, that red giant is also going to run out of fuel. It's going to stop. It's going to stop making a fusion. Gravity is going to collapse in on itself. But instead of a supernova, because it's not big enough, it's going to become a planetary nebula, which still is pretty cool. Looks like that. And in the center of the planetary nebula is a white dwarf. 
Um, and a white dwarf is about the size of our Earth. So our sun, 109 times bigger than us right now, is going to be about the size of the Earth when it becomes a white dwarf. And all the remnants is just going to fly off into the atmosphere. And this is a picture of what a planetary nebula actually looks like. So this is pictures taken by NASA, available nasa.gov. Uh, all these pictures are available. Um, we call this the cat's eye planetary nebula. And if you kind of look, if you kind of like tilt your head to the side, you can even see like it looks like a cat's eye. So they called it that. They call it as they see it usually. If they can make a fancy name for it, they do. Um, and in the center, you see that white dot? That's the white dwarf. So that star used to be as big as us, as our sun, um, and now it's about the size of the Earth. But it's still pretty bright in the center. Not as bright as it used to be, but still pretty bright. And all of that stuff around it is just the gas and the dust and everything that just like flew off of it. Here's another picture, the Eskimo Nebula. So another nebula, another star that used to be the same size as our sun, and then it exploded into a planetary nebula. And this shape, they call it the Eskimo Nebula because it kind of looks like the face with the fur hood around it. So kind of like an Eskimo, so they called it that. And in the center, that white dot is the white dwarf. Um, the next picture, though, this is not a planetary nebula. And as you can see, there's a lot more color, there's a lot more it's just more vibrant and exciting and just more dramatic. This is a supernova. So like, you know a supernova when you see it. It's like, is that a su if you have to ask if that's a supernova, it's probably not a supernova because it's going to look this dramatic. Um, all of these light, all of these colors are actually like they took a picture in X-ray light, they took a picture in gamma ray light, in infrared light, and they overlaid it. And this is the picture you get, what we call a composite. If you look right in the middle, you're going to see like this bright blue dot. It's a little hard to see, but that bright blue dot, even cyan, uh, I would call the color, that's a white, that's a white, um, sorry, that's a neutron star. So white dwarf is what our sun will become. This was a super massive star that becomes um, a neutron star. There we go. I keep getting the words confused. After you say it enough times, they just stick to you. Um, but yeah, all of that, it just kind of flying off of it is the remnants. And everything that's left in that neutron star, that's about the size of Manhattan. So super tiny, what we're looking at right now. And we call this Cassiopeia A, Cass A, supernova remnant. This picture also is available on NASA. And you can actually even get it as a poster. I'm th I'm, I should have this as a poster in my house, but I don't. I Maybe one day. This, so now that you guys know about the sun and about stars and their life cycles, let's actually talk about the eclipse. This is a picture from thegreatamericaneclipse.com showing coverage of what the eclipse is going to, uh, how much coverage the different parts of the U.S. is going to get, and the path of, to of totality, where it's going to be 100% coverage. So notice we're kind of in the middle of 70 and 80, so 0.7 magnitude, 0.8 magnitude. So we're going to get about 75 percent coverage, which is still pretty cool. We're going to see like a crescent in New York City, uh, but a lot of people want to go to totality. So that's along that line in the center. Um, and actually, at the end of the presentation, I'll show you a simulation of what it's going to look like. And one of the best places to see it this year is Columbia, South Carolina. That's a really good place. But anywhere along this path is a really good is just you'll see, you'll just have to be there look up into the sky with some safety features of course don't don't use your naked eye cuz uh, very the sun is very luminous even with an with a solar eclipse a lot of people uh, ruin their eyes thinking oh it's a solar eclipse it's not going to be that bright it's still going to be very bright which is why a lot of you guys have those glasses when you came in uh, you can use those glasses to actually look at the sun safely during an eclipse and even go outside now if it's not cloudy and look at the sun there so after the presentation, you guys can go outside and look at the sun anytime you want with those glasses. Um, let me talk about an experiment that's actually going to happen during this eclipse. So Donald Bruns, and that's his uh, contact information in case you guys are interested in, he in hearing more about what he's doing, he's going to measure starlight deflection. What that means is uh, starlight gets bent 
light in general gets bent when it gets really close to a massive object. So he, and this is the, this is what Einstein predicted with his theory of relativity and describing that gravity as geometry. The way he described it is, uh, Newton described it as, oh, you have mass, you have mass, we attract each other. So anything with mass attracts. So we're all attracting each other in this room. We just don't feel it because our mass is so tiny. And also because the Earth is so huge, we're feeling the Earth's gravitational attraction instead of each other's. Um, but Einstein took it a step further and said, we're not just attracting each other, we're more like bending the space around us so that things come towards us. And people said, that actually makes a lot more sense. So that's how Einstein described it. But in order to do that, they had to perform real life experiments to show that. And the first time they did it was in 1919, the last solar eclipse that, uh, that happened in the United States. So they did, they did it in 1919, and they did prove him right. However, there was an 11% error, and uh, scientists, we don't like error, even if it is like 11%, like you tell my students, like 11%, that's not that bad, right? It's almost a single digit. Uh, we're trying to get it to zero. We like 0% error. Like we can't have 0% error, but we're gonna try. He wants to redo this experiment this August, so this hasn't been done yet. This entire paper was about how he's gonna do it and what he's gonna use to do it um, to achieve this, and then after, August, he's going to publish another paper about it. So this, I'm going to talk about like how he's going to do this and a little bit about uh, what he plans. So this is kind of like what he's talking about. If a star is kind of behind the sun and its light goes towards us, as it approaches the sun, it starts getting bent. And then when it starts getting bent, when it reaches our telescope, naturally, if something hits our eyes coming from here, we're going to see it's coming from there. Because it's hitting our eyes from this angle, we're just going to draw it back there. However, the light is actually bending, and our brain isn't picking it up. It's kind of like, it's similar, but not the same as refraction of fish in water, where the fish looks closer to us than it actually is. That's a little different, because that's refraction. That's how light bends in water. This is gravity, how light bends interacting with another massive object. But you can think of it as sort of like the same, sort of a similar thing. Um, and notice, the farther the star gets from the massive object, the sun the less of the difference of the um, deflection, so like the bending of the light. Um, so he's trying to find stars really, really close to the sun so that he can measure a really big angle. This angle, of course, is exaggerated. It's not going to be this big of a deflection, but it's still going to be a deflection enough where he's able to measure it, measure like where it's supposed to be and where, it's, where he's actually seeing it. And this is another picture. So like without anything in the way, we're just looking at the star. The star's hitting our eyes. That's it. But as soon as you put something like the sun in the way, oh, no, stopped. Oh, there we go. There we go. So as soon as you put the sun in the way, it starts bending. And since it's bending, now the angle looks like it's coming closer, closer from the top than from the bottom. So before, from a low angle, after from a high angle. And this is more of like what Einstein was talking about. So he's describing that if you have mass, like us right now, we're bending the space around us with our mass, kind of like this picture here. This is gravity. You're literally bending space time around you and creating a dip. So anything that comes towards you starts falling into this dip and starts curving around. It just so happens that the Earth is dipping down in such a way that when the fragment of Mars, uh, the fragment of Mars that hit us and part of the Earth got ripped off, it started bending around the Earth in such a way that it became our moon. So if our moon, and I, and I don't know if you guys knew this, the moon is actually a part of the Earth. It was a part of the Earth. It got broken off of us when a fragment of Mars hit us during what we call the period the heavy bombardment. So we bend gravity in such a way, the Earth bent gravity in such a way, that the fragment of the moon uh, is currently just like in a stable orbit around us. Um, and if you kind of like, if you're able to calculate it in such a way, that's how we're able to send satellites. We can calculate the curvature of the Earth so that we can just keep satellites in a fixed orbit so they don't go flying or flying back into us. 
So if you kind of look, the observer is towards the bottom of the screen where we are. The light bends, we trace it, our eyes trace it back so that the ap apparent position looks a lot farther out than it actually is. Here's a picture of gravitational lensing. Uh, NASA loves using these pictures. This is uh, a bunch of galaxies. Actually, every single thing in this picture, except you see that little plus sign at the bottom? That little plus sign is a star in our Milky Way. So we're looking out and a star got in the way. So like Hubble's taking a picture and within our Milky Way, a star is in the way. And that's that little plus sign. Notice there's no other plus signs anywhere. That means every single thing in this picture is a galaxy. So literally like a galaxy like our Milky Way, Andromeda, the Triangulum, all of those things. So when people start saying, do you believe in like aliens or there's other intelligent life, it's hard to say that we're the only ones. I mean, we have no proof in it, uh, a concrete proof at least, uh, but it's hard to, to feel like we're alone when you have literally in just this one picture so many galaxies. So everything in here is a galaxy like our Milky Way. We haven't even been out of our solar system, let alone outside of our Milky Way, and we're talking about visiting other galaxies. We have a long way to go. One, one day we will, maybe not in our lifetimes, but maybe one day we will. But it's it kind of like looking at these pictures kind of gets you excited about we're really not alone. And if we are, that's just like, that's a crazy thought. Like if we actually are, uh, the, one of the theories is that we actually are alone, which proves uh, this thing called like the Fermi paradox and the Drake equation. If you guys want to look more into it, um, it's called the Fermi F E R. M I and the Drake equation, D R A K E, kind of like the singer, um, they predict that like all of their stuff that they talk about, um, all of that makes sense if we are alone. But kind of like humanity hopes we're not alone. We don't like being alone. We want to find people like us. Um, but who knows? So this picture, back to it, is the light from galaxies kind of bending by these two super massive galaxies in the center, the two yellow ones that you see. Um, when the light from behind it kind of travels to the Hubble telescope when it takes a picture, the light is being bent, and notice it's being smeared out along where, it's, where the two galaxies are curving space-time, the thing that Einstein was predicted back in literally the early 20th century while sitting in a patent office. Uh, I don't know if you guys know about the story of Einstein. He actually couldn't even, he had a hard time finding a job. He had to get somebody to pull some strings for him, and the patent office did somebody else a favor by hiring him and got him the lowest uh, level clerk, patent clerk in the office. So while he's doing all this work, he was also sitting on his desk thinking about, you know, gravity as geometry and the bending of space time and E equals MC squared. Like it was no big deal, which is why like when you talk about him and you read about what he's learned, what he wrote about, he was doing this all by sitting at a desk, no equipment, no nothing, just pen, paper, and his brain. That's why he's one of like the uh, greatest uh, thinkers of our time. So this proves, this uh, not proves, but supports, uh, because Einstein was able to prove his uh, general theory of relativity, but this further supports his general theory of relativity and the bending of space-time and thinking of gravity as geometry. This is a picture from the 1919 eclipse. So like I mentioned, they got an 11% uncertainty when they were measuring how much the light was bending, how much the starlight is bending for, from the gravity. And the white light that you see around it is called what we call the corona. So unless you have total totality, 100% coverage, you're not going to see that corona. You're going to see a nice crescent, but you're not going to see the corona. Um, so Bruns expects a 1% uncertainty for this experiment, or a 1% error, which would be really cool. This is the equipment he's using. He went into literally pages in his, uh, in his uh, paper about how he's going to reduce his error and how he's going to fix like, the equipment and what he's gonna, how he's going to modify them. Um, the telescope he's using is a refracting telescope. The difference between refracting and reflecting, refracting, uh, the light gets bent and goes straight into your eye. So you kind of see it like straight on, kind of like binoculars. Reflecting telescope, the 
the light gets bent and you're looking at it at a 90 degree angle. So usually the reflecting is for distant objects. So like I have a reflecting telescope because I like to look at messier objects, nebulas, uh, star clusters. Those are really far away. Refracting telescopes, they're more close up. So the moon, the sun, even birds, uh, usually people use reflecting, t refracting telescopes. So that's why he's using a refracting telescope with a 101 millimeter aperture. Um, and then, so it's about this big. So about 10.1 centimeters, and a centimeter is about the width of your pinky. Uh, for us in, in the United States, a lot of us have trouble with the metric system, so that's how I remember it. A centimeter about the width of your pinky, roughly. Um, the camera he's using is a my, uh, monochrome microline 8051 CCD camera, and he's using this because he needs to take a lot of pictures in a short amount of time. So he, with this camera, he's going to take 100 pictures in 140 seconds, and he needs a lot of pictures so that he has a lot of data to work with. Um, and it, the eclipse literally is only 140 seconds, two, two minutes and 20 seconds. So he's got to be able to take a lot of pictures really quickly. He even went into detail about, he, he made a sen he even wrote a sentence saying that the internal fan within the camera will be set to low to minimize the vibrations of the camera so that the pictures aren't smudging. So he went into like a lot of details just to talk about how he's going to re reduce the error. And this is the mount he's going to use, the software BISC MyT Paramount. And if you guys are interested, the paper is available online and you can read more about each of these equipments that he, that he talks about and goes into it. This is another picture, same website, greatamericaneclipse.com. Uh, this shows more of what cities are going to be viewed. So it goes all the way from South Carolina all the way into just under Washington state, so into Oregon, like the top half of Oregon. Uh, so some cities, uh, and this is also available online, greatamericaneclipse.com. Charleston is a great place. The place I'm going to show you guys is Columbia, South Carolina. Um, also, Nashville, Tennessee is a good place. Kansas City is just outside of, um, just outside the eclipse. It's like right on the border, but possibly Kansas City is a good place. Um, and just going right on through. Casper, uh, Wyoming. I think he, he actually said that he will be doing the experiment in Wyoming. He didn't say what city, but Casper is a great place if he, where he's going to do, where he's going to do this experiment. Bruns, the guy that I was just talking about. Unfortunately, as you can see, New York, not along that area, but we will still get about a little over 70% coverage. And what I want to show you guys today is this program called Stellarium. Uh, now, this program is free, and for some reason, nobody knows about it. So like, I'm constantly always talking about it. The first time I saw it was when I was working at Copernic Observatory in upstate. Uh, they use this program to teach their Boy Scouts and their Girl Scouts and any visitors that they come up there. They teach all of a lot of their astronomy using this program, completely free, compatible on Linux, Mac, Windows, Ubuntu, like literally any any software, any uh, processing system that you want, it's compatible on it. Um, and it's a simulation software. It's called Stellarium, um, and uh, it's available online. The PDF of the user guide is available on Wikipedia, available to download. So I'm going to use this program to show you guys what the eclipse is going to look like. I'm going to show you it, how it looks like in New York, and also how it's going to look like in Columbia, South Carolina. And then we can do whatever we want with this program. I'll show you like all the different things you can do with it. So actually, I'm going to ask for the lights to go off so that you guys really feel like you're in space. Well, looking at space. So this is what the program looks like, Stellarium. When you double click it, it just opens up fairly quickly. And I think I was able, it's a small file too. I was able to download it actually in the middle of a, one of my graduate classes at Binghamton. I was just sitting there one day. I'm like, I should download this. So when you click and drag, you can look around. And I mean, New York City does not look like this, but they just kind of put a landscape just so you feel like you're on Earth. Um, if you look, the moon is out. So if we actually went outside right now and looked at the moon, we would also see Venus not too far from the moon and the actual moon. 
and you can click and drag north, south, east, west, and you can change wherever you are. So right now, if you go to the location window, there's like a bar towards the bottom and a bar towards the side. If I click the location window, it's telling me right now that I'm somewhere in New York, planet Earth, name city. Let's go to Manhattan. So that's where we are right now. So Manhattan, New York. There's also a Manhattan, Kansas. We want to go to Manhattan, New York. So when I click it, we're here. So this is what's in our sky right now. So still the moon, still Venus. Now let's go forward in time. When I click the date time window, it's telling me that it's 2017, June 19th, and it's in military time, but it's at 1.36 PM. And you can go forward in time to the date of the eclipse. So let's go to August. 21st, and it's about 1.37 p.m. And let's kind of zoom around and see if we can find the sun. Oh, it's up there, but notice that little black thing next to it. That's the moon, actually very close to it. So if I even change the time a little bit, maybe an hour before, you can see how it actually moves across the sky. But already at 11 o'clock, you'll start seeing that the moon is already approaching the sun. But let's go forward back in, forward in time. So this is now currently 137. And notice the seconds keep clicking. I can pause it. I can pause it so that the seconds stop. I can also go forward in time, and I can go backwards in time, which is what I'm going to use right here. But first, I'm going to zoom in. So it looks like the sun is already almost being covered by the moon. But I don't want to sit around and wait for it. Like, I can press play, and the clock's going to keep ticking. But this is going to take forever. So the nice thing about this program is you can actually go forward in time. So when I click it once, notice the seconds are moving a little bit faster. Click it again. Now the minutes are moving, and we're starting to see some progress. Let me click it one more time. So that's about how much we're going to see from Manhattan this August. So we're going to see kind of like this downward crescent. So if you try to look at this with your naked eye, you will hurt your eyes. So please don't look at it with your naked eye. Use the glasses we gave you guys as you were coming in or set up. Uh, you can go online. There's a lot of instructions on how to look at, safely look at eclipses so you don't hurt yourself. And you can go even more forward in time and see how it passes through. So that's the eclipse. Um, not so fancy when you're looking at it from not, not total totality. So let's go a little back in time to 1 o'clock. But now let's change our location window. So now I want to show you guys how it's going to look like in Columbia, South Carolina, right here. There's a bunch of uh, Columbus and Columbia. I'm going to look at the one in South Carolina. So now we're in Columbia, South Carolina. And it even says Earth, Columbia, South Carolina. And it shows you kind of like uh, how high you are above the water. You can't really see it, but the sun is, uh, the moon is over here. The sun is over here. And I'm going to go forward in time. Oh, let me make sure. If it ever, um, if you ever click and it goes off and it stops tracking, you just have to click on the object and press space. Um, and it like locks it back in. But uh, when you play around with the program, you get, you get used to stuff like that. So let's go forward in time, fast forward, and let's watch our eclipse. I kind of slowed it down for a more dramatic feel. And that's what it's going to look like. So this corona that you see around it, you're not going to see it unless you have 100% coverage. And if I zoom out, you can even see what it looks like on Earth. So it is pretty far in the sky. But notice, suddenly, all of these stars start appearing. So you can actually even, when this eclipse happens, if you're in 100 totality, you start seeing all of the starlight start coming out that otherwise will be blocked out by the sun. 
and even Mars is going to be near it, and Venus is going to be near it. Mercury is hard to see, but maybe during the totality, you'll finally be able to see Mercury, because Mercury is so close to the sun. Jupiter, not too far away from that. Moving back in on that, you can go more forward in time. And notice the total totality does not last that long. So like, like he was saying, uh, about 140 seconds. But still, this part still looks really cool. You can still get a lot of really good pictures from this. You're just not going to get the corona. So you can do a lot of stuff with this program besides looking at eclipses. You can go anywhere, uh, any year, at any location. Uh, I can also show you guys, uh, how many of you guys saw the lunar eclipse in 2015? Or was it, or was it 2014? Now that I, 14? I forget. I was, uh, I was still in college, that's what I remember. Um, the date and time, I'm going to move it actually to, I was at Binghamton, New York, and we saw a really great eclipse, uh, the really great lunar eclipse there. I heard New York City got a little cloudy, so a lot of people were trying to look at the lunar eclipse and they weren't able to. Another cool thing that also happens during solar eclipses is that it actually gets cloudy too. So you kind of have to be careful with solar eclipses. You might have uh, spent a lot of money, uh, bought a plane ticket, went out, and then suddenly this total coverage happens and suddenly clouds. And the reason is because of condensation. Suddenly the temperature is dropping very drastically because now the sun is not as hot as it used to be. And all of the water in the air starts condensing and it forms clouds and suddenly your eclipse is ruined. And you're like, what? It doesn't always happen, but it's a very common thing that happens with solar eclipses. Lunar eclipses, not so much because the moon doesn't give off heat like the sun does. But when the moon gets in the, in the way of the sun, it's blocking out all of the heat and the light that's coming towards us. So it starts creating all, this, all these clouds that happen. So I know, uh, I know a bunch of people who went to go see a, a solar eclipse, like actually like went out uh, somewhere in like the Philippines or something years ago, um, and they were waiting for the solar eclipse and then suddenly clouds. And they were so frustrated. They knew the science behind it, so they weren't frustrated and confused. They were just frustrated. <laughs> so let's go back in time to September 2014. Uh, I believe it was September 27, 2014. It was the middle of the night. So notice, it's 7.50 in September. It gets really, really dark, and you can kind of look around and see everything. I'm going to focus right on the moon. So I'm actually going to type in the moon. It's a little bit easier, and it's going to focus in for me. Oh, I already went a little too far. The lunar eclipse is already starting. Do you guys see that? Let's go back in time, though. Oh, actually, I might have went to the wrong, it was 2015, yes. That was a crescent moon. So this is currently, I'm forwarding, um, fast forwarding in time. It's about eight o'clock. I forget exactly what time it happened, but I remember it was very late. There it is. And I'm actually gonna, the nice thing about this program, Clouds are getting in the way. That's why you're seeing this ugly cloud formation. I can actually remove the clouds and be like, no, I want to keep looking at this eclipse and keep going forward. So as long as you know where something is happening and what time it's happening, you can look at anything you want. And then you can do instant replay if you want and see it go backwards in time what it looks like backwards. And you still see all of the stars occurring, like moving around, because the moon is still moving when it's going through the eclipse, it's just moving very slowly. The eclipse, uh, lunar eclipses take a lot longer than solar eclipses. Um, so I remember being there, I think, for about two hours for the whole thing to be completely covered and then the whole, th and the whole shadow to be completely off of it. 
But if you guys miss this eclipse in 2017, the next solar eclipse, so the thing that I was showing you guys, not the lunar eclipse, the one where the moon goes in front of the sun, the next one is actually going to be in 2024, so in seven years. And that one's actually, you'll be able to see it from New York. Uh, Buffalo is going to have 100% coverage, so get in a car or buy a plane ticket, go up to Buffalo and see it, or anywhere along the diagonal where the other cities are going to be. But if you stay in New York City, you're going to get like over 90% coverage. So you're not going to see the corona that we were seeing before, but you can still see uh, a really good coverage, like a tiny little crescent will be there, not as big as it is this year. So if you miss it this year, you still have, you still have another one in seven years. Very rare that it happens so close together and especially like in the same country okay cool thank you guys <laughs>